Uh, good morning, folks. We are live, so I'll call the meeting to order and ask for the clerk for a roll call. Councillor Shortree. Present. Councillor Dayu. Here. Councillor Barry. Present. Deputy Mayor Danielson. Present. And Mayor Moffat. Present. Uh, thank you. May I have a mover and a seconder for the approval of the agenda? Uh, Councillor Shortree, Deputy Mayor Danielson. Moved by Councillor Shortree, second by Deputy Mayor Danielson, be it resolved that the November 18th, 2021 regular council meeting agenda be approved to circulate. All in favor. Carried, thank you. Uh, are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest today? Uh, seeing none, may I have a mover and a seconder to adopt the minutes of the previous meeting? Uh, Councillor Dayu, Councillor Shortree. Moved by Councillor Dayu, second by Councillor Shortree, be it resolved that the November 4th, 2021 regular council meeting minutes be approved to circulate. All in favor? It's carried, thank you. Uh, I believe we are straight to parks, rec, and trails business. And we will bring in cards. Good morning, Chris. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Uh, up for you is your monthly activities, and uh, like everybody, lots going on. What would you like to highlight for us, if anything? Uh, the biggest thing at the moment is we start switching over the past month and, and moving through the next month to getting things prepared for winter operations in the trails division. So a lot of work on the ski trails. Um, things are in great shape, uh, have been able to do some work um, at the south end of uh, what's known as the bear trail, the, the ski trail, where uh, we were able to add some aggregate to uh, some drainage improvements where the kinds of changes in weather over the past several seasons where we tend to get these rains mid-season have caused us to have to shut that trail where water's cooling. So we've been able to do a lot of work there. And, um, hopefully that's going to help with the weather changes, but as of right now, uh, we are accepting uh, applications for seasons passes on those ski trails and there's a 15% uh, early bird discount if people get their pass before December 15th. Um, other than that, uh, operations really as normal for this time of year and, and still seeing um, drastic increases in revenues and related attendance for Trails Division. Yeah, terrific. I noticed the, um, uh, for the fall colours, that's quite a number of cars that were turned away. And, um, you know, following up from our conversation yesterday, uh, it will be interesting to see if we can actually make some progress on a, a timed entry to eliminate the disappointment those folks must have felt. Uh, this year. I don't know if, if Council has any questions of anything that Chris has in his report. We can, uh, I'm sorry, I, and once again, I'm having trouble scrolling through his report on my computer, so it's a bit, a bit slow. Uh, anything from Council? Deputy Mayor Liz, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment that it's, it's really good to see the revenues, uh, um, you know, that they're, that they're up considerably particularly given the challenges that we've uh, we've all been experiencing. So really nice to see that. Uh, if there are no other questions or comments, I would look for a mover and a seconder to receive this report. Deputy Mayor Danielson and Councillor Barry. Moved by Deputy Mayor Danielson, second by Councillor Barry, be it resolved Council receives report PRT 2521 regarding monthly activity report for October submitted by Chris Carr dated November 18th, 2021. All in favor? Carrie, thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Uh, public works business is next, so we'll bring in the group. Good morning, Council. 
Good morning, Mayor and Council. Good morning, Lyle. Um, first up for you is uh, monthly activity reports. Uh, anything that you'd like to highlight for us? Um, not a whole lot. One thing I'll note is that we do have our grader back in service, finally. It's been a long time down the shop, so it's set up for winter. They're just putting the blades on it now and I'll get it parked down near the airport. <clears throat> um, otherwise, uh, it's been fairly routine. We did sell our 2011 Ford F450 and we got a lot more money than expected, which is great. It uh, came in around 32,500, which is uh, a lot more than I was expecting. So that's, that's good. Um, otherwise, fairly routine. Everyone's been busy doing the, the changeover for the winter season. And that's about it. If anyone has any questions? Uh, yeah, any questions of council? Council for a while on his report. Uh, may I have a mover and a seconder to receive it? Uh, Councillor Dayu, Deputy Mayor Danielson. So by you, second by Deputy Mayor Danielson, be it resolved that Council acknowledge receipt of Public Works Report PW4421 regarding monthly activities submitted by Lyle Bergstrom dated November 18th, 2021. All in favor? It's carried, thank you. Uh, and for the Blue Box transition program, uh, transition update, I believe Melissa is coming in to join us to give us that input. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Uh, good morning, Melissa. You've got quite a, an interesting report here with uh, some choices that we're going to have to make in the future. So if you want to take us through that, that would be great. Yeah, so it, just an update on, um, on things as they've been, uh, as they've been rolling along. Um, it's a lot of information uh, with the net result is really we don't have all the information that we're, we're needing to make um, decisions yet. Um, but just to give you a heads up that uh, that's expected um, next year and uh, some, some fairly uh, substantial decisions are, are going to be needed to be made um, at some point next year. So that's, uh, that's where we're at. And I'm just I'm happy to answer any questions and uh, provide any information council would like to receive there. Great, thank you. Councillor Dayu. Thank you. Um, Melissa, could you talk us through just for a minute more uh, on under the challenges section that you've written up, certified compostable materials now included, but without targets for collection or management. And there is a potential increase in these materials on the market, which we would effectively be responsible for. You know, in a way, I think it's great if more compostable materials are being used because it can just be composted down, you know, in private homes or, or somehow facilitated by the municipality rather than being returned to the, uh, you know, to the system. Um, so I, th I think that's positive, um, but I wonder if you had any sense of, of scope or, um, or thoughts on how we might handle that um, should indeed a lot of compostable material come this way so that the producers can avoid having to reclaim the recyclable ones. Do you, do you have any further insights or a crystal ball on that? <laughs> sure. I, I mean, at, at this time, compostable plastics are a fairly small component of, of the waste stream. Um, and they're very poor, they're very difficult to manage. So they, they, they can't be managed in the plastic stream. And then in the compost stream, they're difficult to manage there. In the waste stream, obviously they, they just become waste um, and, and the issues there. So they are a very challenging material. The new regulation though does give producers um, the ability to offset their uh, recycling targets by con using compostable plastics instead. So, but what it doesn't require is them to provide anything to manage them. So we don't know um, if they end up in sort of the blue box collection, we don't know how they'll be managed there. If they're refused from that, that collection system, then they be, become part of our municipal waste um, system. Uh, they cannot be managed at home, unfortunately. Um, 
they do not break down in a in a backyard composting or even um, in a, the current plastics anyways that are out there in, in a food cycler or something like that. They require a much, much higher heat and much more mechanical process than ah. Than are available, and that's where even at some of the sort of um, commercial composting um, facilities at the larger um, plants and that kind of thing, they're even having trouble managing them at that level. Um, they just don't break down as as quickly, and and as as well as they need to, and there really is no. Um, there's not a lot of control or sort of what materials are actually made up of. You know, they're called compostable plastics, but what what that actually means. And, and we've seen some of that historically in things like um, oxo-degradable plastic bags and things like that, where they're basically just breaking down into smaller components of, of plastic, essentially. Um, okay. So they can still be classified as compostable, but they're really not uh, entirely biodegradable in regular systems. So that's why I say it's just, it's a challenge. And, and it's one of those questions that we just don't really know where it's going to go or who's whose lap it's going to land on um and it's 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 a it's just a red flag as far as uh, materials go that's out there okay and and well acknowledged sort of in the uh in the municipal waste discussions um and organic waste discussions and, and around the table so yeah it'll be interesting to see how it does uh all become finalized because we've We've talked um, before about this. You, met, you know, you say discussions in the municipal, um, you know, groups and throughout the entire process. I remain, I think we've talked before, but remaining a bit cynical that that all the right things will be captured for the right reasons, especially in remote and rural communities. Um, and it's great that they're trying to um, have any have the intent to standardize. Uh, but I, I think that there will be lots of things that will fall off the edges and be left for us to clean up. So we'll. You know, we'll just have to wait and see how that plays out. Uh, are there any further questions of this heads up for Melissa, uh, Councillor Barry? Just in regards to um, <clears throat> the setup that's happening at Maple Lake Landfill, um, do you see this changing the layout, or is it how how this will impact how we're collecting at at our landfill, our mega landfill? Uh, if I may, Mayor. Yes, please go ahead. Um, there, uh, that system has been designed to be quite adaptable and um, uh, to changing systems and to changing um, methods. So, removing the uh, the operations from the actual landfill site is 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 a, is a great benefit. Obviously, then we we can separate those. How how that actual site will be operated, or and who operates it, um, you know, will be part of the the discussions along the way. But uh, no matter no matter where we go, blue box materials will need to be collected. Waste will need to be collected. Construction, all the other diversion materials we have, even if we took blue box out of that site, that site is still is still needed. Uh, we still have a whole lot of other materials that are in our hands to manage. Um, and even, even if the blue box materials remain there, um, whether we manage them or somebody else manages them, it still works within that, that site. Does, does that sort of get, get to where you were headed? Uh, thank you for that. Is there anything further for Melissa on this? Uh, and if not, may I have a mover and a seconder to receive the report? Uh, Deputy Mayor Danielson and Councilor Shortry. Moved by Deputy Mayor Danielson, second by Councilor Shortry, be it resolved that Council acknowledge receipt of Public Works Report PW4621 regarding blue box regulations and program transitions submitted by Melissa Murray, dated November 18th, 2021, for information. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Thank you, Lyle, and thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, fire Services business is next, so we'll bring in the Fire Chief.
There it is. Good morning, Chief. Morning, Mayor. Uh, a couple of reports for you. First up is monthly activities. Is there anything on there that you'd like to highlight for us? Yes, there's two items I'd like to highlight this month. Uh, the first one is our fire prevention slash public education. In uh, October was fire prevention week. And uh, I just want to commend our communications officer, Chad Ingram. He did a wonderful job with our limited exposure with the COVID. He was uh, maintaining daily postings on both Twitter and Facebook. And I, what he did was very admirable for, for meeting our requirement for public education. The other division I wanna highlight for this report is our training division. Uh, again, Chris has been very good at doing scenarios. They're time-based scenarios. Uh, everyone's done vehicle education refreshers. The real highlight here was uh, the outdoor wilderness training scenarios. He uh, worked with all the crews on on bringing a patient out of the bush. And that was in anticipation of a hunter or something having an incident. And ironically, we had a person with had a chainsaw accident on North Shore Road. And a lot of the skills that they highlighted in the training were used to get the patient down the hill from, from the accident. So both of them should be commended on how their, their activities really went towards our, uh, our successful month here. Yeah, that's terrific. Thank you for sharing uh, those details. And as, as we talked about yesterday in projects and priorities, we have, uh, you know, there is no end of things that uh, that Chad can promote for the fire service. So um, his his ten year plan, I think, is is well entrenched. Um, are there any questions uh, from council for the fire chief? Uh, and if not, may I have a mover and a seconder to receive this report? Uh, Councilor Dayoun, Deputy Mayor Danielson. Moved by Councilor Dayoun, second by Deputy Mayor Danielson. Be it resolved that council receives report FD eighteen twenty one regarding monthly activities submitted by Michael French and dated November eighteenth, twenty twenty. All in favor. Carried, thank you. Uh, next up is a very generous donation from the Dorset Firefighters Association. Definitely, I think uh, this uh, donation is a, is a, we very well received within the operations of our department. Currently for any off-road access in that we uh, respond with an ATV and rescue bogging but we have to actually take the time to load the rescue bog on the existing trailer and it's loaded awkwardly and it takes time. With this new trailer, we'll be able to bring our snowmobile wheel back into service. The rescue bog will actually be enough room for it to be attached. So it increases our, or decreases the response time to be deployed. Their secondary uses would be, we put all our ice water equipment on it. So once there's a call, everything will go at once. Again, giving us a more effective, efficient response. And there's secondary uses that it can be used for rehab with the addition of a, a small heater. We can use it for ice water. If we have a fire call, we take all the equipment out it and uh, use it again for rehab. So it would be a welcome addition. And uh, we do have currently have one in station 80. It's been proven quite effective over the years. So uh, I really commend them and thank them for their offer uh, the donation. Yeah, that's great. And of course, just the, 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 the cautionary caveat is, is for us to always remember that once we acquire that asset, it's ours to maintain and replace going forward. So it's just, we just need to remember uh, that the donation is very generous and welcome, uh, and, but it will be ours to maintain and, and uh, replace. The life um, expectancy is 20, is 20 years for this. And uh, going forward, if, if need be, what would happen, what I could foresee happening is one of the smaller trailers would be, would be surplused if this proves effective. Well, it sounds like, I mean, it sounds like the plan's already in place on how to use it and it's used, you know, being used similarly and, and successfully at another station. So by all means, uh, other thoughts from council, anybody have anything they want to add or ask about? Uh, may I have a mover and a seconder to support this generous donation? Uh, Deputy Mayor Danielson and Councillor Berry. By Deputy Mayor Danielson, second by Councillor Barry, be it resolved that Council receives report FD 2121 regarding a donation from the Dorset Volunteer Firefighters Association, submitted by Michael French, dated November 18th, 2021, and that Council concurs with the recommendation made in the said report and accepts with sincere appreciation the donation of a 23 foot enclosed trailer from the Dorset Volunteer Firefighters Association. All in favor. That's carried, and we'll also make sure that we get uh, a letter. Um, up to them on behalf of council as well. So 
not sure who I'm saying that to, but somebody remember that we're going to write a letter. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Chief. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Enjoy your day. You too. Uh, finance business is next. And I believe the treasurer will be coming in. Is she coming in? Okay. Oh, there she is. Good morning, Madam Treasurer. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first up is just uh, the tax write-offs. I don't think they need much explanation. They're fairly standard for um, the purpose for which they're provided. Um, any questions or comments from Council? I may have a mover and a secretary to receive that report. Uh, Councillor Dayu and Councillor Shortry. By Councilor Dayu, second by Councilor Shortry, be it resolved that Council receives report DT 2021 regarding tax write offs submitted by Karen Vincent dated November 18, 2021. And the Council hereby approves the noted tax write offs under Section 357 of the Municipal Act for taxes in the amount of $791.83. All in favor? It's carried. Thank you. Uh, next up is the account summary. And if anybody has any questions, uh, hopefully they ask them ahead of time. But if not, Welcome to do so now. And seeing no movement there whatsoever, may I have a mover and a seconder to uh, receive that report? Uh, Councillor Dayu and Councillor Barry. Councillor Dayu, second by Councillor Barry. Be it resolved that Council has reviewed the expenditures incurred as set over the November 18, 2021 account summary in the total amount of $591,090.83 and hereby approves payment the same. All in favor? Carrie, thank you. And uh, some pretty exciting news about a photocopier. That it is. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, and thank you for leading into the other two. You're, help you're making my job very easy. Thanks. Um, I'm going to make it easier when you're finished about the photocopier. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in July of 2015, we purchased our, our existing copier and uh, we did start experiencing some issues in 2020 uh, whereby a hard drive was replaced and it has continued to give us um, a little bit of grief, uh, a, a tweety noise of, in particular that is very disturbing on uh, many levels. So I was asked to uh, investigate the replacement of a copier. So I did so, um, I, I reached out to our supply, our maintenance supplier, and she gave me some contact people to call and get information from them. I also reached out to Halliburton IT um, and I also reached out to neighboring municipalities to see what everybody had to say about copiers. It was very enlightening. So uh, we've decided to go with the Sharp MX4071, which is at $5,639 plus tax. Um, all of them, all copiers basically do the same thing but this one had a couple of extra bonuses that uh, we thought were impressive. The walk-up motion sensor, and of course, it was the lowest costing uh, for servicing and so forth. Be so these were kind of um, things that we definitely would consider. The costing price or the prices that were offered was because the SHARP is in conjunction with the Ontario Education Collaborative Marketplace which requires us to sign an agreement with SHARP um, to continue to get these uh, cost savings and so forth. Uh, as I described in the report, it's a no cost to the township for us to sign up with this. It meets all government standards and all vendors must meet specific criteria to be qualified as a vendor for this OECM grouping. So, Basically, what I'm asking from Council is uh, approval to sign the agreement. And one of the nice things about the purchase here is that we have a reserve in place that was set up previously to fund software and photocopier purchases. So this won't be a cost uh, to the tax levy or the, the residents. It's, it's in the reserve. We'll just move the monies over from that. So. Council has well, I'm question. sure I'm sure glad you chose the 4071 because I understand the others are. Sorry, I don't mean to make light. <laughs> one of my questions though is is 
I was wondering at first when I read this, I thought, why isn't this covered under delegation of authority? And I'm assuming it's because it's uh, the agreement, the contractual obligation to move forward in a different direction. So, because when I first read it, I thought, I don't think council needs to get involved in buying photocopiers, but for the agreement purposes and and, and uh, the change that will come with that in the provision of other supplies, it makes much more sense. Uh, does anybody have any uh, questions or concerns with uh, going in this direction? Seeing none, may I have a mover and a seconder to get the MX 4071, uh, Deputy Mayor Danielson and Councillor Shortreed. By Deputy Mayor Danielson, second by Councillor Shortreed, be it resolved Council receives report TT 2221 regarding the purchase of a new administration office photocopier submitted by Gene Hughes and dated November 18th, 2021, and the Council authorizes staff to sign the agreement and transfer the funds from the administration special reserve as required. All in favor. Carried, thank you. Uh, and the fee changes, and I just want to note that Councillor Dayu raised something yesterday that she's going to raise again, I think. Um, and so we take it away. I believe the other department head uh, members will be coming in to speak to their sections, if I'm correct. Is that correct? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, are you going to bring them all in at once or one at a time? One at a time. Uh, okay. So uh, you're going to do with men then. Okay. So in dealing with admin, there's only a couple of small changes. We again kind of uh, pulled the neighboring municipalities to see what uh, costs and so forth they had in place for these types of things. One of the new ones is the electric charging uh, vehicle charging station, which is um, a rate of $2.50 an hour. So that will be added. Another item under uh, treasury in particular is the tax bill reprint. Um, other municipalities are charging for this service. A lot of these calls come in at uh, tax time when people have to do their income tax and need a copy of the bill. So that's a $10 charge that we've added. And the other thing that we've run into on several occasions here is people calling or coming in or requesting property tax history research. Most of the information is, is contained on the computer, but there has been times when we've been required to go down to the vault and find the paper copies and information that way and do some research. So we are um, suggesting a $30 per hour charge with a minimum of one hour charge for this service, because as I said, it does involve one of my staff going downstairs and digging through the boxes and the uh, looking at old rule books and so forth. So it can be quite a timely process. And that is it for administration. Why would somebody, would the property tax history research be um, just like a history, a personal, someone wants to know the history of taxation on their property just for history reasons or for sales reasons? I just find that a bit curious. Sometimes I think it's a capital gains thing, uh, depending on a situation with an estate and so forth. So they need to know assessment information from way back when. And as I said, a lot of it is contained on the computer, but there's those before computerized that we'd have to get this, the assessment information for. Yeah, I didn't think of the capital gains part. Uh, any questions uh, from council on these proposed changes? Uh, Councillor Dayu. Thank you. Jeannie, I, I apologize for not knowing this because I probably should. The electric vehicle charging station, is that the fee that Algonquin Highlands puts on top of the IV charge that we retain or is that the IV charge? I believe that's the IV charge. Okay, and so do we, re do we retain any portion of that as the overall administrator facilitator? I'm not 100% sure on that. I would have to check. Okay. I apologize for just throwing that at you. I, it just occurred to me um, now as we were sitting here, but okay. I will check for sure. Thank you. Yeah, that's actually a good question because I think I think my assumption had been that it's that 250 an hour belongs to the township to offset the provision of the electricity. But yeah, so we'll find out. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else know? Uh, Deputy Mayor Danielson. Awesome. 
I seem to recall in previous discussions that it seemed to me that there was a, a percentage of the fee that came to the municipality. But well, we'll have that. We'll have the information when it comes back. Does it, sure. back? Yeah. Does it go back? Yeah. Um, okay, we'll look for that. Uh, and Madam CAO has her hand up. I'm just looking here because Corey was just here at our last meeting. So I'm just gonna look at our, la our last uh, our last meeting. I think it's in there. Okay, okay. well, then we'll, we'll carry on. Yeah. Uh, all right, so cemetery fees, I would assume that uh, Madam Clerk is gonna speak to that. And Lyle. And Lyle for the operation. Oh, so part of him. Welcome back, Mr. Bergstrom. Thank you. Uh, who's going first? I, I will start and just cover the proposed uh, fee increase for the plots. Uh, we have had an increase since 2018, and reviewing surrounding municipalities, the increase to 950 appears to be uh, consistent. There have been some changes to the legislation that requires an increase in the care and maintenance contribution. So it's highlighted there for council. It's now went from 250. 290 or 40 percent, whichever is greater, the cost of the plot. And scrolling down to the monument of markers, care and maintenance again, legislation changes have increased the care and maintenance portion of the install of a marker, depending on the size from 50 to 100. And then for an upright four feet and under is gone up to 200 dollars as opposed to 100. And those uh, come into effect, those changes by legislation January 1st, 2022. Uh, are there any questions of Dawn about those particular changes? Uh, Councillor Dayu. Thank you. It's not actually about these changes. It's more of a forward looking question. When we were um, discussing green and winter burials and, and uh, the costs associated with those and the cost recovery possibilities associated with those, um, we, we touched on how many plots we had left um, and what we do in 20 years or however long when we've run out of plots, the possibility that green might overtake the world and you know and there will be a great demand on that and and i just wanted to circle back on that now cuz we're on fees and wonder if if between now and next fee schedule review would it be possible to take a look at you know where where are those fees going is it all for cost recovery are we putting money in reserve to buy additional land is it sufficient basically take a 40,000 foot look at um, at how we're planning that financially and how those how the fees are reflective of that. Um, so it's really for next year, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, that's not something to add possibly to the, I'm looking sort of at the clerk and the CAO, the big picture discussion, we could add that to the list because I, I know that um, as has been pointed out, there is no obligation for a municipality to, to provide um, services once, once cemeteries are full. Um, and so we, we did touch on exactly that is, is are we, would we be looking for land? Yeah. So I do think it does need to be part of some bigger conversation. I just don't know when and where it, it would live. I don't know if either of you have any thought on that. At least I do see your hand, but I'm looking to the clerk or the CAO on that. I mean, we, can just, we can have a conversation about that next year sometime. Yeah, we'd have to include the treasurer because she's aware of how the funds can be used and which portions, the care and maintenance. Things yeah, like that. It's, it's, who knew there were so many rules about, um, you know, the operation of, of, of burial grounds, mm -hmm. uh, actually cemeteries, but um, Madam CAO. Um, and Don's exactly right, is there's legislation governs what we, how much we have to collect for care and maintenance and what we can use it for. Um, and then we, we set the fee for how much it costs us to actually do a burial. and. Um, so we've continued to evaluate if we're doing any kind of cost, cost recovery on that um, as we do fees. So um, we can bring that to council uh, next year for sure, just to, to have a look at. Yeah, because we did, you know, we did get the, the good piece of information about, about how many plots are left and they don't, um, they, they don't sell out rapidly, but we do have, we did talk about, as you just said, we talked about some concerns with green and so I think there's that conversation. Uh, I think when we get when we get more details on on the winter options and get 
you get moving on green, then that's that's that can form sort of part of that. Because once the green, for sure, and depending on where we land with with winter, um, we'll have to revisit fees again anyway when yes. that bylaw is implemented. So yes, we will. let's plan to put that all in the same discussion bucket. Uh, okay, then uh, if there's nothing further on those particular fee increases, uh, we'll move to Lyle in terms of the equipment. Yes, <clears throat> thank you. So you'll see the internment rates have, uh, I'm proposing quite a, quite a hike. Um, we did an analysis of what our real costs are for performing the internments. Uh, this is cost recovery. So this isn't buying us equipment. This is paying the relatively cheap rental rate of equipment we already own and the staff to operate it. So I just changed the rates to what real current costs are, uh, so we aren't subsidizing internments moving forward. Um, and certain items have got a lot more expensive, such as foundation installations. The bag of concrete used to be $2.50 to $3, now it's 10. Um, so it, that's uh, one of the reasons why I see the, the foundation installation jump substantially. But um, yeah, so cost recovery, Disinternment, I just uh, increase the factor uh, the same as what the, the $150 increase was before. Uh, so that's that's how those numbers were derived. Um, and the explanation is appreciated that it's that it's uh, not a revenue generator, that it's cost recovery. So that's that's an important point, I think. Uh, thoughts from council, questions, clarifications required? Uh, Councillor Barry and then Deputy Mayor Danielson. Just wondering where the conversation of columbarium fits into this. Like, I know that we've we we have a joint use with Minden Hills, I believe. Is that correct? Uh, we have joint use uh, with Minden Hills for the storage vault at um, uh, Twelve Mile Lake. And is that part of a fee structure? Uh, where does that live? No, it's not. Uh, and why is that? Oh, well, let's, we let, an agreement with let's let sleeping dogs lie then. <laughs> we don't pay anything for it, uh, it would appear. Uh, and the columbarium, those costs will come forward once we have the columbarium. Uh, the RFP is going back out, and then, then that fee will be will be brought back, I would assume. Yes, hopefully in the spring, once we have our RFPs closed, then this will be brought back to include fees for columbarium. Right. Yeah, so it's coming. Okay, thank you. Um, Deputy Mayor Danielson. Uh, I just wondered, uh, I mean, I, I really appreciate that we're, we're looking at full cost recovery and that there's no, uh, you know, there's no revenue associated with this, but I wonder if we did a comparison with other municipalities on, on fees. Yes, we have. And um, fees are all over the map when you look at different cemeteries and it, it has a big impact on the size of the cemetery group, full-time staff versus, um, I'll call ours part-time staff, um, seeing as they have other duties. So we're not we're not overly high, but there are some outliers that are extremely low, and I can't speak to whether they subsidize internments, if they have volunteers helping. I some of the fee structures, I, I couldn't justify one way or the other, but we seem to be in the middle with us like-sized cemeteries. Well, certainly, I think, uh, you know, really good question, and, and where in other um, comparative fees are sort of all over the map, it makes sense then to just go back to what, what is our cost recovery, then we know it's, it's a true number for our purposes, so I think that's, that's a good place to have landed. Was there another hand there? Oh, there's Lisa back again. Go ahead. <clears throat> I, I never really thought about this. So with the internment rights plot sales, there's the 950 plot care and, and that are for the, sorry, 570 for the plot, 380 for the care and maintenance. Is that a, that's a one-time fee? So you buy the plot, you pay the $950 and that's it? Or I, I guess just kind of walking me through how that works. Yeah, yeah it's not an annual care and maintenance fee. It's a one-time no, fee. A one -time. Yeah. And then there's an additional 380 on top of that? The total is 950 and 380 of that is care and maintenance. Okay. And 570 would be the actual purchase of the plot. 
and the 380 is care maintenance one-time fee. Okay. Brings it to 950. Okay. I guess it's just the way it was laid out there. Thank you. Uh, anything else on cemetery fees? Uh, okay. Thank you very much to Lyle. And we will move to parks, rec, and trails fees. And Chris Carr will be coming in. Welcome back, Chris. Thank you. Uh, you've got your fees here. I don't know whether you want to go through them or whether if Jen wants to put her hand up right away and get, get in ahead of that. <laughs> oh, Councillor Dayu, did you have something you wanted to add? Thanks. Uh, yes, and, and uh, uh, as we discussed yesterday, the, the question that I've got is with the, um, the new staff uh, proposed for the coming budget. Is there provision in these um, fees for um, for cost recovery on that or um, or no? So what I'm proposing with these fees is across the board a, a 3% increase. And last year we didn't do any uh, fee increases um, based on the circumstances. Uh, at the time of, of writing of this and, and looking at inflation rates between last year and this year, a 3% across the board matches where we're at. I'd be looking at also targeting a 3% increase in uh, operating costs, which would match that. Um, it, we, we, when we're talking about revenues, we have to do a little bit of a guessing game between now and the end of the year to see where we're going to end up. But if we're to stay on par with where we've um, uh, ended with cost recovery on the water trails program over the past several years, and we're budgeting in around an 81% cost recovery, we would only need to assume a 5% growth in, in revenue for next year. Uh, if I build 3% or sorry, not 5% revenue, 5% in attendance, plus a, uh, a 3% or assuming a 5% growth in attendance, attendance and a 3% increase in revenues. So an 8% overall assumption on how much revenue we're going to make would keep us in the 81% cost recovery, including the additional wages. Um, so, so sort of. <laughs> so that's, so basically your, your, your calculations include the positions that were tentatively approved yesterday. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I have to look at end of year revenues as we're, we're finalizing a budget and, and make some assumptions on where we're going to end up next year to, to stay within that amount of cost recovery. So uh, I think I recall the 81, the 80%, 80, 81% cost recovery. We talked about that a number of years ago, and that was sort of the, that was the goal when we were setting the fees and, um, and, and looking at a new model of how, how that's all done. Is that, so that's still the same? Am I, am I recollecting that correctly? That's right, yeah, yeah. And so then back to, that back to Councillor Dayu's question then is, I guess the extrapolation of the inquiry is, is the 80, 81% cost recovery enough? And I guess it's kind of a yes, no. Sorry, can you say that again? Is is that is that percentage of, of cost recovery enough? I mean, I don't uh, know. That that would be a, a a question we'd have to look at and, and decide on, and then whether or not we wanted to change our model to consider uh, building our fees structured on a, a one hundred percent cost recovery um, when we're. You know, when, when we're looking at that 80% cost recovery, we are typically coming in over in attendance and revenue each year. Um, but it, it's not advisable to, you know, let's say this year we've seen just, I'm just throwing a number out there. This is an actuals, but let's say we've seen like a 30% growth this year over last year. 
we could potentially assume that we're going to get another 30% growth on revenue next year. But what I look at is the past several years and kind of average that growth and then come in with a, a safe number in between there. So, um, you know, typically we're, we're, we're setting up our fees on an 80% cost recovery. We're recovering more costs than that. Um, but you know, if, if, if we wanted to have a philosophical question or look at some possibilities around like what different, different fee structure models would look like, we also need to consider what other area parks that are similar to us are charging for fees. Um, uh, we are above Ontario parks now, uh, um, there, for example, Algonquin parks back countries, $11 per night plus tax. So. Um, and so I would I would ask council if they're interested. I mean, we do have an entire um, an, an entire uh, model based at uh, the the eighty uh, percent. If if we change it in one place, we have to change it across the board, which could be um, a heck of a lot a heck of a lot of work. And we do see exact as example in Chris's earlier report, twenty seven percent increase just for the month alone in in trails revenue. So we're we are exceeding the estimated five percent growth at a 3% increase. So I think the risk could be increasing a little bit more. You could lose patrons is, is the other possibility. So you're, then you start working against yourself. I'm going to go to uh, Jen had her hand up first and then back to Deputy Liz. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that explanation. Um, and I, um, I'm happy to leave things as they are, to be honest, because I'm confident that that all of those parameters have been borne in mind as these fee increases have been have been uh you know considered M the only thing that would trigger my desire to look at revamping the fee structure would be if or when that 20 percent that falls on the levy that isn't considered part of the tax you know the the, the cost recovery when that the absolute amount of that gets to be you know disproportionately higher than we feel comfortable with because 80% is great, but if costs go up year on year on year, then the 20% that we're responsible for or the taxpayers are responsible for is also going up year on year on year in absolute numbers. So uh, my only request would be, you know, um, to, to, to the CAO and, and to, to Chris to just keep an eye on what that figure is and at the right moment, if we should be, you know, thinking to revamp that we, we think to revamp. Yeah, and I think that's part of the annual review that they undertake all the time. As Chris said, he you know got, has to get to year end to, to finalize the numbers and see what that looks like. And, and certainly, if, if he if it gets to year end and those numbers are um, reviewed and there's something askew, um, <laughs> they'll definitely bring it back and say we need to have another look at it. Yeah, absolutely right. Uh, uh, Deputy Liz, um, a, a, a comment and a question. Um, I just was kind of hearkening back to earlier days on council and the, uh, and the concern that the costs were high and that there, we were empire building and, uh, you know, the, the change that we've seen over, over the years and the, and the increases in revenue uh, in, in this department have been, you know, really uh, rather extraordinary. I think we're moving in the right direction um, and that, uh, you know, I mean, so while recognizing that it is a burden on taxpayers to to cover the difference it's it's kind of traditional that in in most municipalities recreational facilities aren't and services are not always cost recovery um and i've asked this question before and i apologize i can't remember the answer these are odd numbers are they are they calculated so that when you add tax it comes out to an even number oh thanks Okay, it just it always kind of blows my mind when I see this list of very strange numbers and think, why, why are we charging? So um, I do increase it on a percentage, and um, I, I don't, and that percentage is based on what um, inflation rates are. Um, so it is just a straight three percent calculation all the way across. There's no, uh, there's no consideration of, of any sort of rounding to even numbers or anything like that. It's just a percentage. Keeps keeps nickels and dimes in the system. 
any questions? Oh, uh, Councillor Shortry. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say these fees keep it affordable for people. Um, for example, just a ski, ski trail permit is $12.67. I think going anywhere else, you're going to pay $30, $45. So it's, it's for our community, it makes it an affordable option for outdoor activity. So keeping it within that uh, increase of 3% works well, I think. Um, I'm here. Okay, Lisa, go ahead. Sorry, it's... I was unmuted. Sorry. The, the last thing was, and I know we've talked about it and I, maybe it's not even a discussion for here, but at one time, um, Chris was talking about having um, a collaborative fee. If, if um, this relates to the ski trails, if, if you are part of like the Halliburton Nordic ski trails, you would get a further discount and vice versa. If you were part of the Algonquin Highlands <clears throat> trails, you would get a discount with the Nordic. And I just wonder if there's been any talk of that or if, if that's been put on hold um <clears throat> there's nothing in place at the moment we have tried a couple of different things over the years we did have a joint pass uh that people could purchase that was essentially an increased rate on either pass that would allow them access to each one but also essentially be a discount over if they were to buy both um there was no uptake on that after several years. We have also for several years uh, been offering them and anybody else a discounted rate on uh, if they're to show a season's pass from another location, not just the, the, the Halliburton Nordic trails, but, but any place. Um, if, you know, if they're part of the core of the Nordic and they show us their season's pass from that location or Arrowhead, they'd get a they'd get a discounted rate on our passes. So um, we're offering that to any organization, um, but we don't have at the moment any sort of joint pass uh, with Halliburton Nordic. Um, the trails fees are only a portion of um, Chris's report, there's facilities and the tower and lots of stuff as well contained there. And is, does council have questions on um, or need explanations on any of the rest of it? It's quite a long report. My, my question that I was a little confused, well, I wasn't confused about my question. I was confused and thus it generated a question. Picnics, no alcohol, 250 per day. So picnics, um, we can't book our parks. So how does that work? Uh, can you let me know what page you're looking at? Uh, they're not numbered, but it's uh, under facilities. It says um, it's, it's the insurance rates, facility user insurance rates. And it goes through the type of event, you know, no alcohol events with the number of people. And then it says, uh, so Sorry. So yes, we, we have, uh, these are set by the insurance company. And um, <clears throat> if there were some sort of special event that uh, required additional insurance, depending on the size of it, yes, normally uh, just a regular uh, picnic, we're not doing bookings or anything like that. But if we did get a request, and there was some sort of larger uh, function that we deemed maybe a higher insurance consideration, that's when that type of fee would be applied. So it's a, um, it, it, it's really a fee structure set up by the insurance company to offer the ability for people to uh, uh, buy a rate to add essentially insurance to that, to that function. Uh, okay, because we have had in the past, we've, we've had a, a couple of inquiries, people saying, you know, I want to get married at a place and can I, you know, can I rent it? And we don't, we, we say, well, you're welcome to use it. But if someone else turns up to walk their dog, I guess they're part of your wedding. Um, and we don't get a lot of those requests, but would it be something like that if somebody wanted to have, I don't know, like, a, yeah, like a, it would be a, how many people would have to be at a picnic before it had to be um, organized for the township? And it's, there's no, there's no set number. Um, we don't have anything structured like that. 
um, it, it would be a, an event specific consideration. Like for example, what we have had in the past is something like a cottage association saying, you know, we'd like to host this event. It turns out, you know, we're, we're going to have it catered and we're going to have X amount of, of people. And then we have to have a discussion with the insurance company to see if, okay, is, is this type of event reaching the scale that it may require additional considerations? And um, in some cases, the answer would be yes, and this would apply. And they have a number of questions that they ask related to it. In other cases, it's a matter of, okay, does the cottage associate, association already have their own insurance? In that instance, they may just need to add us as an additionally insured. It's very... Um, it's very event specific. Okay. Um, the, uh, oh, uh, Liz, go ahead, please. Um, so if, if a family decided that they were going to go to Elvin Johnson Park and have a picnic, say there's, uh, I don't know, 14 of them and they bring their own food and, and they've got a little tipple in the picnic basket. We're not talking about that, right? Or, or cause I can't see how we would ever control anything like that. No, typically, when something turns into an event, it's something that's been, um, you know, advertised and managed and people are being invited to it. That, that's, that's typically when it switches from just a, a kind of get together that's just happening um, into, into something that would have more liability attached to it. Like if, like if let's say that you know, uh, uh, the Cottage Association was to say, yes, we're gonna have, you know, up to 200 people and we're going to be putting out invitations and there's going to be advertisements on the radio you know now it's turning into a a planned uh event that has potential liability associated with it it's an it's an interesting conversation and it's something i've discussed with the insurance company as well and and they don't even often have a because I've asked similar questions like, well, how many people and what are the what are the exact parameters at which this type of thing would be uh, uh, set into motion? And, and they kind of have the same answer. It's like it's it's event specific. Um, these are the types of things that you may want to consider and you should reach out to us if you're unsure. Yeah, and normally I would think that and we have this, this experience uh, this past year, but it was canceled due to COVID is a lake association wanting exclusive use of a park for a very large celebratory event. Um, and and in, in that case, they actually have to have conversations with Chris and go through the process. That's the trigger then to say, well, we need to do something here. Uh, and I think it, you know, like you say, it's event specific. Um, Lisa Berry, Councillor Berry. Just wondering with, you know, the current landscape, has there been an increase for inquiries for outdoor rentals? just you know people want to gather I don't know I'm thinking at like the pavilion in Stanhope or Oxtongue and and they want to have access to the facility maybe for the washrooms but other than that they would like to have use of the spaces outside. We haven't had an increase in those requests um they have been the same ones that have been ongoing for a number of years, being things like the, the Cottage Association events at like uh, Elvin Johnson Park. Um, so no, actually there hasn't been an increase. Uh, Deputy Mayor Danielson. Um, I just was wondering about your use of the term exclusive use of, of a facility. I could see that happening with, with say a building, but, but we couldn't offer exclusive use of a park. Can we? Do we? I don't know if we have, I don't know if we have, but that I think that request, I know I had that request and I, I said you need to talk to Chris. So I don't know how those conversations ever turned out. But no. I don't think we, we don't have any sort of booking or rental process with any of our park spaces, meaning whenever uh, an organization reaches out. And, and they want to have an event, it's explained to them that they, they won't have exclusive use and it is still something that other people are going to be able to access the park. Um, there may be a request related to, to an event that not all the details are sorted out, but the mayor and I may be thinking about the same thing where they might be asking council, would 
would you consider blocking this space off for us to use for that particular amount of time? Because we don't have any sort of process in place, I would refer that as a request back to council as kind of a one-off type thing. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask uh, about the tower, um, the fees for the tower. Um, you know, folks who have used the tower faithfully for many, many years uh, continue as understandably continue to lament that they have to pay to go there at all. Um, but specific, and, and I, I completely understand that. But I just wonder about the, the fee for the buses is, is my concern, uh, is should they be more? Because that's not, that's not per person in that bus, is it? That's the bus. No. So somebody, so, so a coach line, a coach line can come with 30 passengers and they only have to pay 60 bucks to go to the tower. I don't think that's enough because they're coming, you know, those bus companies are making an awful lot of money and they're bringing, you know, 30 or more people up to probably use, you know, use, use the facilities and they, they might buy a few things, but I, I, and that's the thing that I, that I, there's always a thread of concern around that, that. Um, you know, a couple of bucks to walk up is great, but if you're bringing folks from out of town who themselves are paying a bus company probably a lot of money for a day trip, and they're going to uh, use the facilities that they should, those prices should be more. Uh, Councillor Shortry. I agree 100%. You see the buses go up there and 30, 40, 50 people get off and they're paying the, the tour company a lot of money to do this. And somebody's walking up there for five bucks and you know the tour the tour company's only paying maybe a dollar fifty per person it just doesn't seem right and i saw another hand was that councillor Dayu? it was but now i'm kind of getting a bit wishy-washy on the thought the original thought was while i agree in principle 100 percent, the counter argument would be as we encourage within Canada, people to share vehicles, to, you know, to take public transportation, to not be one person per car. This is the sort of trade-off that is sort of expected as, as part of that. And I know we're not, we're not specifically responsible for that, but I, um, I wouldn't want to increase costs so much that people would revert back to taking individual cars to the, you know, to the Dorset tower because we don't have the space for them and we're trying to go in the opposite direction. So, um, so I wonder if there's a bit of a hybrid where there's a, a, a parking fee for the bus and then um, a per capita fee for, uh, for the folks who get off the bus or some, something like that, just to make it even more complicated. Yeah, thanks for that. Because I think that my concern specifically with the, with, the, with the buses is I don't know, appreciate the thoughts on the, on the um, you know, for people coming as a group. I think they're going to come as a group anyway because they're coming up out of Toronto for a day trip and there are sometimes overnight trips up into the park um, and, and they're paying a lot of money. I, I don't know that somebody who, I don't, if a coach line had to pay more and they had to up their ticket price per person, I don't think they would stop coming to the doors of tower. Uh, um, anyway, looking for thoughts from, from other members of council is I, I'm only concerned with, with the buses, the, the tourism enterprise that I don't think is being charged enough to use the tower. Uh, and either council supports a re-examination of that or, or not. And if the answer is that there's a council supports a re-examination of that, then Chris can, can do that and bring it back. And if council doesn't support that, we'll carry on. And uh, council short read does for sure, so. Anybody, anybody? Uh, Councillor Dayu. May I ask, uh, Chris, if, Chris, do you have any more thoughts on whether that would fly on that, if that's a good idea, et cetera? I, I, I'd have to put some thoughts together on it. It isn't something I've thought of in depth until now. Um, the fee structure around the various types of buses, coaches, et cetera, is something that was in place uh, when I became manager. Um, I wasn't involved in kind of the breakdown of that decision, and we have been increasing based on percentages, as I've said, since that time. But uh, 
I, I certainly hear what everyone's saying, and I, and I agree that relative to you know a, any of these, be it the ten to fifteen passengers, sixteen to twenty nine, thirty passengers or more, etc., um, they are around a dollar fifty, a dollar sixty per person if if those buses are full. Um, the way to clean this up the the most simply would be to charge a per person rate no matter what uh as in whether you're in a car or a van or a bus or a truck or an SUV or you know an rv it's the question when you get to the gate is how many people do you have okay it's you know two 201 per person at the first portion of the year and then during the busy season it's it's the 502 per person plus tax and you'd apply the same thing to the buses, but that would be a significant percentage increase uh, for those companies right off the hop. There's lots of different ways of looking at it, but it is it is a complex uh, fee structure, and it is um, the people on the buses are getting a discount, and and they are making a profit off of it. There's no question about it. Um, it could be something we could look at. So um, while you were talking, I did a quick Google search and there are two companies offering day trips up into the park at $69 per person and $55 per person. So, I mean, the bottom line is I'm not seeing any movement at all from Lisa and Liz. And so if you don't want to do it, let's not, can, let's not keep talking about it. If you do, we'll ask Chris to look into it. I'm just offering the, the idea. It's a yes, no for council. Councilor Barry. I don't know. I think it kind of averages out because, and I think for administration, it's probably easier just to have a flat fee. I think, you know, sometimes a bus would come up full and sometimes it would come up half full. You know, I think if, I still think the rate of a walk up, there's still resentment in the community for having to pay that fee. Like you have a, you know, a family of, I don't know, four or five people. It's still what is seen what used to always be free as as being a lot of money and then if you want to go up when the scene is beautiful you have to pay more for the same experience so i don't know i i, I don't support complicating the fee structure with individual charges when the bus arrives i think some of that could be paid ahead of time and it makes it less confusing the question is do you think buses should pay more yes no flat fee yes no Flat fee. But do you think, should they pay more? Should we increase those costs? Anybody? Councillor uh, Deputy Mayor Danielson. You're on mute. Mute, Liz. You're gonna have to start over again. Sorry. Um, I, uh, I, I, I do think that we could charge more for the, for the buses, uh, flat fees. I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's complicated if you start charging individual fees as they get off the bus, but, uh, a, a flat fee. And I, I think it, it could increase. I, I hear the concern uh, about, you know, the, the difference in fee for an individual coming off a bus and an individual walking up. It, it doesn't seem completely fair. Um, I support reviewing it and uh, the, the thought that occurs to me, Chris could figure out if this is a good idea or not, but uh, would be that we increase the fee to more of a per person rate, but then for the for this size of bus and then for this size of bus, there's a proportionately greater discount in appreciation of the fact that they're using more of a public transportation system and they're not occupying, you know, 80 um, spots in our parking lots. So you would get the benefit of a reduction if you know, the, for each size larger bus that comes. That would be my idea. But in general, I support I support um, Mayor Moffat's uh, uh, request. Uh, so I think what I'm hearing, Chris, is just to have a little look at the bus fees in, in terms of um, uh, generate a little bit more revenue uh, from buses. So we'll see that come back. And as uh, the CAO has a hand up. 
Um, just for a uh, question around process, and Don might have to help me out here, is the fees normally come back uh, in December for approval by bylaw to be effective in January. So is, is council asking for Chris to bring something back for the December meeting and, and will that work? And that question's for Dawn. <laughs> um, yes, I was gonna comment on that public notice will be given after this meeting. And normally our fees are set because of the public notice so the public can have a look at our fees. So that was my question to Does council wish to have it revisited and put on hold or have them revisited after Chris has time to investigate. Um, I guess because you need to have the, the, the okay, back, back, back. Could these, you know, because there's parks and rec fees are built in with skis and skiing and trail passes and whatnot, and there'll be snow by then. Um, Madam CAO, help me out here. Um, could council um, pass the fees in December the way they're proposed and then bring that particular one back after Chris has had an opportunity to look at it? Well, there won't be any buses going to the Dorset Tower shortly, so. No. <laughs> So we could do that and just, and then if we, if we have to change it again, we can do that January, February, somewhere in there. Uh, I saw a hand somewhere. Where did I see a hand? Councilor Bayou. Uh, yeah, that was, that was my thought too. If we could just get her done now uh, and then we've got some months ahead before we need to worry about the Dorset Tower. So, yeah. Okay, so well, let's do that then. And um, that just provides a little more, uh, allows us to follow the usual process, uh, get things in place for January. Satisfy the clerk, she's starting to vibrate over there. <laughs> and uh, um, then we can bring back the, the bus um, discussion a little later. Uh, okay, well, that was interesting. So good. Any further questions for Chris on those fees? Because we still have, uh, we have um, public works fees. Okay, thank you, Chris, for your time. And uh, we'll bring in Mr. Bergstrom. Thank you. We're bringing him in for no changes. <laughs> uh, Angie, what was that what you were going to say? No, I was just going to, um, I did bring up the, um, the charging station fees information. Um, and the 250 an hour user fee is um, was recommended by Corey to um, it's for cost recovery, as well as to go to a portion of the annual fee that we're required to pay. So, okay, that clarifies that. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, Lyle is here, but uh, Schedule F has no changes, so I don't even know that it needs to be spoken to. <laughs> Just that one schedule. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. I see my my screen froze again, and I couldn't get past that one that one page. Uh, Lyle, take us away. All right, we'll move on to environmental. If no one has questions on the roads roads department section, uh, reason why I propose no changes for roads department is just fairly low use. I think we have around seventeen entrance permits to date uh, for twenty twenty one. So I don't think changing the rate makes a huge impact on our day to day. Uh, moving on to environmental lagoon and landfill. In McClintock Lagoon, I'm proposing a $5 increase per thousand imperial gallons um, capacity of the truck. Since we're not metered there, if, if the truck comes empty or full, they're paying 85% of their full capacity. Um, so it's fairly minor on a uh, typical uh, sewage truck around 4,000 gallons year increase is about $15. So it's not, not a whole lot to worry about. Um, and then there's a bit of a change for uh, hauled sewage between November 16th and uh, May 14th. We charged a standard rate and then had a $100 access fee. Um, there's very little use um, of the uh, lagoon in the wintertime. 
we do plow the entrance anyways. Um, operationally, we should be doing it differently, not plow in the entrance. So I don't think the $100 fee is uh, really fair. We capture it with more of a, a winter rate at $140 uh, per 1,000 imperial gallons. Um, so like the impact there is still fairly minor. On large trucks, it's actually less. They'll pay $15 less a load. But for the smaller... 3,500 gallon trucks, they're about $10 a load more. So it's not, not a huge change, but makes it a bit easier to administer um, without having it, that additional $100 access fee in the winter. Any questions on that? Okay, carry on. Uh, for household waste, we didn't change any of the rates. Um, also as part of the service delivery review, if we're looking at um, having like services across the board, uh, fees will be part of that discussion because we're all charging something a little bit different. So once we get a bit further along in those discussions, then we will be reporting on some ideas or proposals, but uh, I didn't feel it worth to change the rates just yet if we're gonna be having a big discussion on it in the near future. Anything from council? No, nope. carry on. This is going great. <laughs> Halliburton Stanhope Airport. Um, so I put a 5% increase across the board. Um, partially when I was doing this, the inflation rate was at 4.4 projected to be 5%. So that's why I picked the magic number 5%. But I also did look at other airports of similar sizes and what they charge. And uh, we are fairly cheap, like our hangar rentals. Uh, for example, uh, we're proposing 2,445 uh, for our smaller T hangers and then 3,661 for our, our newer hangers. Uh, when you look at uh, Brampton Airport, which is a small municipal airport, their T hangers are $6,600 a month. And then their newer hangers that would compare to our new hangers are 10,200, or sorry, 6,600 a year. And uh, the new hangers are 10,200 a year. Edenville Airport, which is uh, down near Stainer, it's, it's a nice airport. It's very modern. Um, their cheapest hangers are around $6,000 a year. And then hangers that are comparable to our new hangers around $9,000 a year. So um, partially they're closer to city centers. They could probably demand a higher rate than we can, uh, but I don't feel that we are overly expensive. I feel that we're actually quite cheap. Um, but also in the 2022 uh, projects and priorities, we'll be looking at the uh, the airport, updating the land use and development plan, and maybe that also looks into um, the marketability and, and fee schedules of the airport. Um, any questions from council? Uh, Deputy Mayor Danielson. I'm just, I'm just wondering if, if there are any regulations associated with, uh, um, increasing fees, at, um, you know, a certain percentage every year, or, you know, I can, I can see that, you know, maybe we should be raising our fees for rentals, but how quickly do you do that? How much at a time and, and what the impact of that is, is something that concerns me. Yeah, my, sorry, uh, through the mayor, my opinion is the 5%, especially with the, the inflation rate being around 4.4 wasn't uh, extreme. I'm not doing a 15 or 30% increase. And I'm not proposing we ever work ourselves up to the rate of Edenville Airport, but, um, or Aerodrome. Uh, and hopefully we'll get a better market evaluation when we, uh, we update our studies. Um, but I think we do have to do an increase annually to, to ensure that we're not running into more of a deficit uh, if we are. Uh, and none of our rates are, are over others, except for the Bancroft Airport, which is much different than ours. Their tie-down rates are cheaper, and their open hangers are, are relatively cheap, around $1,440. But they're 
much different than what we have. So I, I think we're gonna stay competitive uh, with the neighboring airports and something that's not on here, but our fuel rates are still the 30% above cost uh, in sales. So that's, that hasn't changed. So got you. Thanks. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, just um, very much acknowledging what uh, Deputy Mayor Liz said. Um, I think that, that, that's a really, really important question. And um, as I was putting up my hand, uh, Lyle basically answered it uh, with what I had in mind, which was to wait for the studies to see what comes out of those in the coming year and then and then base any strategizing on that. Um, but it's, it's a great question to bear in mind as they produce the studies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I was thinking the, the, and I, I don't know anything about airplanes or how much it costs to park them, but I just thought that aircraft parking, I thought those fees seemed very low. But you know, I think there's there's more conversation to be had moving forward as as some of that stuff comes forward. So. Um, anybody else for anything here? Okay. Well, uh, I. <clears throat> Get off Scott for you there, uh, Lyle. So good for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I guess I'm looking for a mover and a seconder to uh, receive this and then move forward to um, public notice and bring it back. Uh, oh, sorry, councillors Dayu and Shorty. by Councillor Dayu, second by Councillor Short Reed, be it resolved the Council receives and concurs with the proposed fee changes and directs the comprehensive fees and charges by law be brought forward at its December 9th, 2021 regular meeting for further consideration. All in favor? That's scary, thank you. Um, would you like to take a break just now? I see some nodding heads, at least two or three nodding heads. Uh, so let's take, it's, it's 20 past, let's come back at uh, 25 to, so 15 minutes. Great, thanks. Thank you. Oh, sorry, uh, we are just making some notes. Uh, we are reconvened and we are starting back at number 14, uh, administration business, and we will bring in Mr. Ingram for this. We're starting with the land acknowledgement statement. Good morning, Chad. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Uh, you've been doing an awful lot of work on uh, the land acknowledgement part of our uh, the action plan that Council had requested. So do you want to, I don't know if you're going to read the whole thing, but if you want to take us through what you've learned, you've taken some courses and and uh, and then we can uh, talk about where we'd like to use this. Yeah, sure. It's, it's, uh, it's more complicated than two or three sentences. That's the first thing I'd like to say. Um, you really are acknowledging human history in an area for a span of 10,000 years. Um, so it's a very complex thing when you really uh, delve into it. Um, and what I've learned is the, the treaties are the most important thing in terms of the indigenous lands, acknowledging the treaties and the land rights associated with them are, are the most important uh, thing to do. Um, so that's why you'll see uh, names of certain uh, First Nations in the first sentence of the statement. Um, and those are the seven Williams uh, Treaties First Nations. Uh, so they are all signatories to the Williams Treaties of, of um, uh, 1923. And those treaties ceded 50,000 50, square kilometers of land in Central East Ontario to the Crown in exchange for one-time cash payments and harvesting rights. Uh, so it's a huge amount of, of land that goes from Lake Ontario to Lake Nipissing, basically bordered by Lake Huron and then over towards 
past Pembroke and sort of back to Aurelia. It's a, it's a big chunk of, of land. Um, those treaties led to decades of disputes and legal battles over broken promises, forfeited harvesting rights. Um, in 2018, the government issued an official apology for the impacts of the Liam treaties uh, along with the settlements. Um, the second treaty of note uh, in the statement is Treaty 20. That's also called the Rice Lake Purchase. That was a pre-Confederation treaty signed in 18, 1818, excuse me. Um, and what is now Halliburton County were the traditional hunting, fishing and trapping grounds of the Treaty 20 signatories. So those are the two <clears throat> important treaties that you see there. Uh, the third sentence sort of focuses on the fact that there were other First Nations in this area during that 10,000 year period, they just have no treaty rights. So they're not um, named by name, but there were, and there is recorded history of other uh, First Nations living in this area, both, both the county and Algonquin Highlands, what is now Algonquin Highlands uh, itself. So that explains- So, so go ahead. I was gonna say, so that, that explains what's in those two sentences, basically. And um, I, I don't know if anybody, if council has any questions about that, that research part that Chad's done, but the decision before us is, is uh, there are some recommendations Chad's made about when, uh, when it's appropriate to use, uh, to use the land acknowledgement statement uh, at the outset of council meetings and prior to public speeches by members. And I, I would imagine that those are formal public speeches, not sort of a, a, a pickup Q&A at a lake meeting or just in, in casual, if someone says, oh, well, maybe Councilor Barry could say a few words, she wouldn't whip that out and say it, it would be at more formal, formal invitations for speeches. Is that your recommendation, Chad? That, that's my thought, yes. So what are Council's thoughts? I mean, we had initially talked about, we didn't know what, um, what would be ascertained in terms of the length of an acknowledgement, and we had wondered about having a longer um, acknowledgement to uh, sort of kick off this action plan and then have a, a, a shorter one uh, to use on a regular basis, but it appears that it's fairly compact. So um, is council feeling okay with, um, with using uh, what's been provided in its entirety? And it's, uh, Chad's work has been done in collaboration with the folks at Curb Lake. Uh, and so looking for thoughts on, on uh, on how you prefer to use uh, use this acknowledgement, uh, Deputy Mayor Liz. Um, my uh, my first thought. Well, I, I'm assuming that we would read this at the beginning of every council meeting. That's the recommendation. Yep. So when I first looked at this, I thought, well, you know, this is uh, this is good, excellent work, Chad, and and you know, good information for us. Um, I kind of thought, okay, is it necessary that we would actually name each of the First Nations as you have done in the statement? But having listened to what you're saying, I, I suspect it is important that we do individually name them all. So the, <clears throat> the advice, because they're all equal, equal rights holders across the whole area. So the advice is if you name one, you name them all essentially. You could go the other way, you could name none, or you could name seven. But the the advice, because they all are, even though Rama and Curve Lake are the closest to us, they're all equal treaty rights holders throughout that whole 50,000 kilometer area. So that's why uh, that's their preferred wording. It had been my thought originally that we would have a, you know, sort of a, a, an official formal statement like you've given us, of that we would read at, at particularly special occasions and, and maybe a, a shorter one for, for every council meeting that we have. But, uh, but you, you know, you've given us a good explanation for why this needs to be included in its entirety. You, you know, I, I, I could always uh, flush it out more if you wanted a longer formal one for different, um, you know, I had beginning of council mostly in mind, right? So, I mean, if, if you wanted a longer one for special occasions, I can add some sentences, that's not, an issue. Uh, I mean, I think, as I said, that it's it has landed to me at a, at a decent uh, length that provides the appropriate acknowledgement that we're looking for. Uh, and then I think there's other work that we can that we can and I'm going to speak to that in a minute, but when we finalize how we want to use this. 
Um, I think there's other work we can do to keep uh, the momentum rolling. Uh, Liz, did you want to weigh back in there? No, I'm, I'm okay for now. Thanks. Yeah, uh, Councillor Dayu. Um, I like it a lot. I appreciate wholeheartedly that a, a great deal of conversation with uh, First Nations communities has gone into this and that it respects their preferences and requests. So I am very happy um, voting for it as is and, and agree that it's a, it's a great statement for the beginning of council meetings and for any other formal gathering where there is an official presentation or an, an official invitation of some, of some kind that, that is probably a, a step above lake association meetings. So if there was something at the, at the museum or flag raising, then that would be the appropriate moment to do that. But I think, I think we're, we've got a really solid statement here. And, yeah, and to your point, we could um, work on um, having, getting council's decision on this language. Uh, what can come next is a bit of a policy around when it, when it, when it would be used. So we know what, uh, specifically. Um, uh, Deputy Mayor, Liz. Um, just a comment about when, when we would use it. I would, I would think that for any event that is specifically ours, but if, as you said earlier, Carol, when, for instance, if we go to a Lake Association meeting, that's not our meeting. We're, you know, we're there to provide information. So, it, you know, it, it would, uh, I'd like to see us develop a policy of, of, you know, what specifically where this would be used and what's appropriate. Um, I would like to, um, just offer some thoughts too, and I'm just gonna call up something because I did actually, uh, I have a couple of additional requests of council through this process. So um, what I wanted to say at this moment is I think most of you, most of you know one of my personal passions is local heritage and um, in conjunction with what Chad has done, I wanted to um, just dally a little bit in a local perspective ahead of a couple of additional requests of council. Um, similarly to what Chad has said, <clears throat> we know that formalized details of First Nations in, in this particular area, they're slim, but the legacy is not. And there, uh, there's evidence of Indigenous use um, sprinkled all over the place. And, uh, you know, has been discovered certainly through my personal research over 30 years, but there really hasn't been so much to grab at. Uh, evidence, um, there has been evidence of Indigenous inhabitation uh, found on in like small tools and pieces of pottery on uh, that's occasionally shown up on sandy shorelines um, around the area. But of course, we don't really talk about those openly because there's uh, there's an inherent risk of scavenging. Um, there are also references to First Nations and First Nations encounters in various books. Uh, lake names were changed <clears throat> by colonizers quite a lot, but a lot of the original names remain and Many more um, have gone through substantial changes over many, many years uh, and changes in pronunciation and spelling. So, for example, Beach Lake was originally called Salomishi and uh, Little Hawk was originally called Pipkwabi. Kwagama is a significantly modified version of, of its original name. And others like Peach Lake, uh, you'll find folks refer to them both as to Peach and Kabakwa, which is its original uh, First Nations name. And there are others like Raven Lake that have really interesting stories attached to them. Uh, we also know that cottagers on Little Hawk traded with uh, First Nations people. Um, and actually my neighbor who's in his 80s, he remembers, he remembers that happening when he was a kid. Uh, we know there's evidence of in research papers about encampments on uh, the various shores uh, of Oxton Lake. And we know that the first census in Stanhope in 1861 included two camps and four families from the Rama First Nation. Uh, and the 1860 Surveyor's Diary for Stanhope identifies portages of the, that the travelers used. And of course, back in then, the, you understand how surveyor's diaries were written. And I got ours from the Library and Archives Canada many years ago. <clears throat> those little dotted lines between the lakes and it just says Indian portage. Uh, but those portages that indigenous folks used, uh, there's still many of the portages that are being used today. Uh, some of which have, you know, people bicker over closing them up. Uh, there's a heritage plaque in Dorset on the Lake of Bay side that acknowledges the role of the Narrows, one side of which is appropriately called Trading Bay. Uh, and of course, the Dorset Museum folks worked really hard to uh, develop um, a heritage, uh, a First Nations heritage exhibit. Um, so I think we have an opportunity to go a little step further. A land acknowledgement is one thing, and I know a couple of you know that I was kind of working on the background of, you know, how can we do better um, and broader in Algonquin Highlands? 
Uh, and I think we have an opportunity to make sure that First Nations history continues to be researched and preserved. And interestingly, we had an email um, from a gal who is from British Columbia and uh, is, is, is moving next year permanently to Dorset. Uh, and she is uh, a, a First Nations person, I believe, I hope I'm not misquoting her heritage, uh, and is really quite excited about all of this and um, the opportunity to make it there. Um, so, you know, the land acknowledgement and website enhancement and ongoing education is great, uh, but I'd like to ask council for council support of two heritage commitments. One of, I think, would need to be in a resolution and the other one isn't. Um, so in 1998, uh, as part of my work as the chair of the Stanhope Museum, I, and I'd kind of forgotten about it, I commissioned a U-Links research paper that discusses the history of Halliburton County by examining the lake names. Uh, within the context or within the framework of First Nations settlement and early interaction between Europeans and First Nations. And it's by no means complete or completely accurate, but I believe it could be a really great starting point for really rounding out our First Nations story on Gotham Highlands. And we have, um, you know, the, the museums are doing good work uh, and we have the, that mapping project that continues. Part of the research done by this Trent University person for, uh, as part of the bioregionalism project, uh, involved researching all the lake names through the Ministry of Natural Resources archives. And it's really quite fascinating. Um, and so the paper is available on, on new links under the great literature list. And I, I can make sure that it gets sent out to council because as I said, it is really quite interesting. And I think that there's work to be done in collaboration with the folks at Curve Lake to, to really round out, instead of just saying we did a land acknowledgement and we're doing this, I think we have a chance to build something a little more TV. So, my requests of council are um, consideration of additional language in the cultural plan. Uh, our cultural plan, embarrassingly enough, does not mention indigenous persons at all. Uh, and if council supports that, then there would need to be a little uh, tweaking of the terms of reference for the cultural plan committee. Um, and what work that would entail or, or draw out, I don't know. We'd have to wait for that committee to, to, to meet again when our committee start. Um, and I'd like to um, uh, really encourage the uh, the museums who are working on the, the museum folks who are working on the heritage mapping project to use the documentation we have to date to start plotting some First Nations heritage that we know of and some of the stories that we know um, on the mapping site. And so add another layer uh, to, to really start bringing that alive. And I, um, it, we could use that ULINX paper as a starting point for further research. So what I would like to ask council is um, I would like us to, and for me, it's really exciting because it's, it's heritage and that's the part that I'm most excited about. And so uh, looking for council's thoughts and support on tweaking the cultural plan and the cultural plan to in terms of reference, that would be by resolution. And then just um, verbally encouraging the, uh, the museum folks who are working on the heritage mapping site to, to add uh, some more First Nations references. Uh, and then slowly, slowly just maybe we can just, you know, weave some more, um, a more firm history together. So that is my request of council um, in relation to the land acknowledgement and the work we've done to date. We're looking for thoughts from council on that. Uh, Deputy Mary Danielson. Um, I think that's an excellent idea and I completely uh, agree that we should go in that direction. I think that's a, that's a good project for the, uh, for the committee to work on and, and information that I'd like to see included in our cultural plan and, and on our website. Yeah, I think at the, at the very least we can, you know, have an addendum or rewrite the intro of the cultural plan or, or something. I think we would be doing doing this, the rest of what we're doing would, would be an injustice if we didn't go to our cultural plan and, and add something in something in there. So, um, okay, so sounds like support. Um, I don't know if anybody else needs to speak to it, but that's, um, I'm quite, actually quite excited about that because I just love research and I love the history part. And I love the mapping and, and I want to do it all myself, uh, but it's not my job anymore. And um, so thank you for your support of that. And I think that, um, you know, just puts us a step ahead of just a land acknowledgement. We're going to do more. I like that. Uh, I think the clerk is uh, modifying that resolution. And I would look for, is there, so we've decided, we've landed on how we're going to use it. We're going to look for a policy about, about where the land acknowledgement is used formally. That will come back in some time. And so does this mean then that we open our December meeting with our land acknowledgement? I assume that's what that means. That's exciting. Um, good. May I have a mover and a seconder for all of this? 
Uh, Councilor Dayu and Councilor Shortley. And I had asked, it's, it is attached uh, to the agenda. I had asked uh, Chad if he could just um, show Algonquin Highlands within the context of the women's trees uh, map. So I think it shows you how big it is. I didn't realize it went as far north as it does. So I thought that was good context. By Councilor Dayu, second by Councilor Sharvey, be it resolved that Council receives report COM 321 regarding the land acknowledgement statement submitted by Chad Ingram, dated November 18th, 2021, and the Council approves the following land acknowledgement statement for the Township of Algonquin Highlands. We respectfully, respectfully acknowledge that the Township of Algonquin Highlands is located on Treaty 20 Mitchisagi territory and in the traditional territory of the Mitchisagi and Chippewa Nations, collectively, collectively known as the William Treaty's First Nations which are Curb Lake, Rama, Hiawatha, Alderville, Scugog Island, and Georgina Island First Nations. We acknowledge a historical shared presence of Indigenous nations throughout the area and recognize its original Indigenous inhabitants as a steward of its land and waters since time immemorial. And that Council directs additional language be included in the Cultural Plan and Cultural Plan Committee terms of reference to address First Nations and be brought back to Council for approval. All in favor? That is scary. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. Thank you, Council. Uh, and we will move into planning business and we will bring in Mr. O'Callaghan. Good morning, John. Good morning. Uh, a number of items for you as always. First up is a uh, proposed shore road closing on Beach Lake in the name of Clark. Yes, uh, this is the bylaw to close the shore road allowance in front of this property. Uh, it was circulated for comments from the various commenting agencies and no uh, objections were received or easements required. Uh, staff are recommending approval of the uh, proposed bylaw as presented. Any questions from council? May I have a move and a seconder? Uh, Councillor Dayu, Councillor Shortry. Moved by Councillor Dayu, second by Councillor Shortry. Be it resolved that Council receives report PL 124 21 regarding the proposed shore road allowance closing fronting property located at part of lot 21, concession four, geographic township of Stanhope Beach Lake, submitted by Sean O'Callaghan and dated November 18th, 2021. And the council deems the said shore road allowance to be surplus and concurs with the recommendation made in the said report and directs a bylaw to stop up close with pay the said shore road allowance be tabled for further consideration. All in favor? It's carried. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, another bylaw uh, for Halls Lake in the name of Smith. Yes, this is another bylaw to close the shore road allowance in front of this property. Uh, again, no objections were received or easements required. And staff are recommending approval of the proposed bylaw as presented. Any questions from council? May I have a mover and a second? Oh, did you have a, oh you're you're beating me to the gun for the mover moving and seconding. <laughs> May I have a mover and a seconder? Councillor Dayu and Councillor Barry. Moved by Councillor Dayu, second by Councillor Barry. Be it resolved that council receives report PL 125-21. Regarding the proposed shore road allowance fronting property located at parts of lot 14 and 15, concession 7, geographic town to the Stanhope Falls Lake, submitted by Sean O'Callaghan and dated November 18th, 2021. The council deems the said shore road allowance to be surplus. It concurs with the recommendation made in the said report and directs a bylaw to stop up closing made the said shore road allowance brought forward for further consideration. All in favor. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, an application in the name of Tantalo on Beach Lake. Yes, this is an application to purchase the shore road allowance in front of this property on Beach Lake. It is a developed piece of property. Uh, a portion of the dwelling appears to be on the shore road allowance as well as a dock. So, um, but other than that, nothing out of the ordinary with this application and, and would recommend it proceed through the regular process to close that shore road allowance. Any questions from council? May I have a mover and a seconder? Uh, Councilor Shorty, Deputy Mayor Danielson. 
approved by Council Short Read, seconded by Deputy Mayor Daniels, and be a result that Council receives report PL 12621 regarding post shore road allowance closing running property located at our lot 21, concession 4, J. Dartmouth Town to the Stanhill Beach Lake, submitted by Sean O'Callaghan, dated November 18, 2021. And the Council approves in principal application OSRA 3921 made to stop up closing and obey the said shore road allowance and that the applicants are requested to proceed in the courts with shoreline road allowance closing procedure. All in favor. It's carried, thank you. Uh, another application in the name of Clark on Cabacqua. Yes, another application to close the shore road allowance in front of this property. Um, again, nothing out of the ordinary um, that is that it, I can see from the application so far and would recommend it proceed through the regular process to close the shore road allowance. Any questions? May I have a move and second? Deputy Mary Danielson and Councillor Dayu. Hi, Deputy Mary Danielson, second by Councillor Dayu. Be it resolved that Council acknowledge receipt of report PL 12721 regarding the post shore road allowance closing fronting property located at Part Lot 7, concession 10, geographic. Township of Stanhope, Cabacqua Lake, submitted by Sean O'Callaghan, dated November 18, 2021, and the Council approves in principal application OSRA 4021, made to stop up and close the Cabay the Central Road Allowance, and that the applicants are requested to proceed in accordance with the Shoreline Road Allowance Closing Procedure. All in favor. It's carried, thank you. Uh, next up is site plan application for Dimensions Health on Maple Lake. Yes, we've received a, an application for site plan agreement uh, for this property on Maple Lake. Um, it is a currently a, a tourist establishment, um, it's recently changed ownership and they are looking, well, they have been doing some redevelopment on the property, uh, mostly replacing existing structures with exactly what uh, was there before. This proposal is for a building, um, it's a two-story multi-use tourist establishment uh, building uh, that they're proposing to demolish and rebuild uh, a new two-story structure in the same general footprint. It is slightly larger than the current structure, so that enables us to require site plan control on, on the property. Uh, the proposed multi-use multi tourist establishment structure will be located in the same general area. Uh, it will be increasing in size from the current building. Um, the proposed structure uh, will also have a walkout basement. Uh, it'll have a total floor area of approximately 13,133 square feet with a footprint of 6,400 square feet. Uh, it will contain a mixed use uh, of tourist establishment uses such as a spa, dining area, uh, meeting rooms, a gym, yoga studio, uh, general reception area, a sauna, and a float tank room. Uh, the structure does comply with our official plan and with our, our zoning bylaw provisions, so staff are recommending approval of the uh, proposed site plan uh, as presented. Uh, any questions of council? I know that, um, you know, we'll just call a spade a spade. We know that there are public concerns uh, about this property and it needs to be stated that, you know, unequivocally that um, the current zoning is being complied with and that we we, we can't make a decision on building a new, replacing a building based on public concern of what may or may not happen on the property in the future. So we have to go with what is what is today and and, um, and this is uh, moving forward in accordance with um, our legislation. Uh, Deputy Mayor Danielson and then Councilor Barry. Um, the, uh, the application, everything looks good. Uh, uh, the only question that I would have, because I know that our concerns were about moving from a tourist facility to a medical facility, I'm just kind of wondering about the float tanks. John? Is that a good um, question or? Uh... As f I'm, I'm no expert in, in float tanks, but my understanding is it, it's part of a typical spa uh, operation. Okay. Uh, Councillor Barry. Yes, <clears throat> I, I just have a couple questions about the footprint. Um, you said that it's on the existing footprint 
but it's also an additional, it's, there is an increase. I'm just wondering what is the increase in, in, foot, in the square footage? I don't have the exact number, but it is overlaid on the site plan. Um, it does show the existing and proposed structures. Um, just zooming in on it. Um, so essentially they're adding to the rear of what the existing footprint is. Um, they'll be pushing the building back a little bit further. Um, as well as including a walkout basement as part of the, the new proposal. Um, does that answer your question, Lisa? Um, a little bit. I still would like to know how big of an increase is it? Is it a 5% increase, a 10% increase? I, 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 I honestly, I can't, I can't open it any bigger than it's showing me and it's still not showing me what I need to see. But I guess my other question is with the increase, will there be an increased need for septage? So that would all need to be reviewed at the, the building permit uh, stage. So it is a, a large enough system that it falls outside of um, our control. It would be through the, the ministry um, just due to the, the capacity of the system, um, but it will be regulated in that they will have to meet those requirements at, at building permit stage. It looks like you have more. Just one more. Go ahead. So with that information, how does that relate to a lake being on capacity with the increased sizage of footprint, septage, and the lake being at capacity? So yes, the, the lake is at capacity. However, this is an existing use. Um, so we can't prohibit someone from um, continuing to use a property that's permitted under the zoning bylaw, provided they fall within the existing requirements, such as law coverage and setbacks, which they are complying with. Um, if they were proposing to sever uh, the lot or create a completely new tourist establishment, then that's when those provisions would come into play and we would have um, the ability to um, essentially deny that application because the lake is at capacity. Yeah, there's, there's, you also have to look at it, same with any property that um, a, a newer building with, you know, a new building with new windows and better insulation and, um, you know, likely, not necessarily, but likely a new septic system is 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 better than an old drafty barn uh, with an in, inefficient, perhaps. I'm not saying that it is. I don't know, but with a, with an older septic system, so there are benefits to the increase uh, or to the um, to the upgrades. Uh, any other questions of Sean on this application? Okay, may I have a mover and a seconder to move it forward to the next stage? Uh, Deputy Mayor Danielson uh, and Councillor Shortreed. Deputy Mayor Danielson, second by Councillor Shortreed. Be resolved that Council receives report PL 12821 regarding the site plan application by Dimensions Health Maple Lake Inc. for part of Lot 28, Concession 5, Geographic Township of Stanhope Maple Lake, prepared by Sean O'Callaghan and dated November 18, 2021. And the Council supports the proposed site plan application subject to the following conditions. That the applicant enter into a site plan agreement with the Township of Monarch Highlands and it be registered on title, and that the mayor and clerk be authorized to sign the site plan agreement on behalf of the Township of Monarch Highlands. All in favor? Carried, thank you. Uh, committee of Adjustment meeting minutes. Uh, any questions or thoughts there? Uh, may I have a move and a seconder for that to receive that? Uh, Councillor Jory, Deputy Mayor Daniels. Councilor Shortry, seconded by Deputy Mayor Danielson. Be it resolved that Council receives report PL 12921 for information regarding the October 29, 2021 Committee of Adjustment Minutes, submitted by Sean Callahan and dated November 18, 2021. All in favor? Terry? Um, license of occupation uh, 
for Livingston Lake. Yes, this is a bit of an interesting proposal proposal here. Um, so currently there's four water access properties on Livingston Lake um, that utilize a uh, landing space um, and parking area that's located entirely on private property right now. The owner of the property has been in discussions with these uh, property owners, uh, the water access property owners, uh, to move this landing area and parking area so it's on uh, the adjacent crown land uh, as well as the township shore road allowance. So these property owners, the water access property owners have provided people here um, showing where they wish to construct this new uh, parking area and docking area uh, on crown land and on the township road allowance. Um, basically, at this point, we're seeking, or they are seeking, uh, council approval in principle as the first step after this, should council grant approval in principle, would be uh, obtaining permission from the ministry um, to occupy the crown portion of the land. Uh, following that, uh, assuming they are successful in obtaining that approval, they would then require a license of occupation from the township to occupy the uh, short road allowance portion of the lands uh, to construct the dock. Um, that that essentially summarizes the proposal at, at this point. Um, I am recommending approval in principle. Um, however, I'm happy to answer any questions if, if council has any. Um, any questions from council? Um, Jen, this is your neck of the woods. Have you been in touch? Have these folks reached out to you at all? What's, is there any, do you have any background skinny on it? Um, no, I don't have any background skinny. I've, I've not spoken to them about this, um, uh, this proposal in particular. I think I, I would have reached out had there been a greater population on the lake and changing the nature of the shoreline right beside the current landing was going to denude even further of a, a vulnerable lake, but actually there, there are not a great deal of people who have properties on this lake. And um, uh, it, it strikes me as a, a fairly minimal change, not being a scientist myself. So um, uh, it, it seemed pretty copacetic from what I could determine from Sean's report. Um, okay, yeah, thoughts from council. I mean, it seems like a, you know, a credit to these folks for, for finding a solution that, that may work. I think they'll, um, you know, they'll have a challenge as there always is with, you know, trying to acquire or, or occupy crown land, but um, uh, nice to see a resolution being, being sought. So, I mean, I, they may have challenges, I, I, you know, with their little parking lot, but they'll have to govern that themselves. Um, any other thoughts from council? May I have a mover in a second for them to uh, provide the support and principle? Uh, Deputy Mayor Danielson and Councillor Barry. Deputy Mayor Dan, seconded by Councillor Barry. Be resolved Council receives report PO 13021 relating to the request for license of occupation of Livingston Lake submitted by Sean O'Callaghan, dated November 18th, 2021, and Council approves in principle the proposed new landing location subject to the following. One, approval from the Ministry of Northern Development, Mines, Natural Resources, and Forestry, and that the applicants entering into a license of occupation for the subject shore rural allowance lands. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Uh, appointment. This is the annual reappointment to the Land Division Committee. It's uh, Liz and I believe, am I the backup? Yes, that is correct. <laughs> Anybody else champion up a bit to be the backup? I know Liz likes Land Division, so. You're safe being the backup to Liz because she never misses a meeting. <laughs> uh, I am happy to take one for the team and uh, and be the backup, the, the alternate, just in case. So if you want to stick both of our names back in there and get a mover and a seconder for that. Councillor Shortreed and Councillor Guy. By Councillor Shortreed, second by Councillor Dayu will be a resolved council receipts report PL 13121 related to the appointment to County Land Division Committee submitted by Sean Callahan. February 18, 2021, and the Council appoints Deputy Mayor Liz Daniels as the municipal representative to the Land Division Committee. Further, the Council appoints Mayor Carol Moffat as the 
alternative member, member to the land division committee. All in favor. Gary, thank you. Uh, the Rogers Tower, we um, had a number of questions and, and asked Sean to do a little more um, research for us. And um, Sean, if you would take us through the results of that. Yes, uh, so this is coming back to council after reaching out to uh, the representative I've been working with from Rogers and asking for some clarification uh, on some questions raised at the previous meeting. So I have outlined the answers in my report. Um, one, um, a, uh, a shield was installed around the existing Rogers Tower on Quagma Lake recently, so that uh, should alleviate any concerns as far as lighting um, impacting property owners on that lake. Um, they did look at co-locating on an existing bell tower. However, um, in their opinion, they're not able to do so in this particular case, and, and they do require their own tower, um, which is being proposed. Um, and they've also confirmed that it is part of the EORM project um, and not in conflict with the overall project. Um, I understand there's been some questions raised as far as co-location. Uh, unfortunately, I, I'm not an expert in, in telecommunication and I, I have to take them at their word that that is what's required. Um, in this particular case. Um, so I am recommending uh, approval of the extension uh, as they're requesting. However, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, should council have any. Uh, yeah, and I know, yeah, Jen does, uh, cause I reached out to, to somebody who's very, who follows this just to see what their thoughts were from their perspective. And I, and I've asked um, uh, Councillor Dayu uh, to speak to that, so. Do you want to take us through that, Jen? Thank you. Yes. Um, uh, thanks very much, Sean, for, for this additional legwork getting these answers. And I think it's agreed across the board that none of us are, are experts in co-location. So if they say they can't do it, then, then that's a face value statement um, to be taken by us. Mm -hmm. um, a, a couple of um, thoughts. One, is it possible to put in the agreement um, a, a requirement for a, a light shield as they have completed on the other tower. Uh, if, we can, if we can get that into the agreement and into future agreements um, in those instances where there are lights required for the tower, that, that would be great. Uh, and, the, and the second point um, raised, which I fully agree with is, you know, there, there's a bit of a difference between making sure that a project has a margin of time built into it for any unforeseen circumstances that might delay the project versus an indefinite timeline for a project. This project has been ongoing since 2015. Uh, another lengthy extension is, is requested and, and uh, the question I suppose bears asking whether we might limit it to say an 18 month period um, just to reinforce our desire to get this done um, and, and to get it done within, within a reasonable amount of time that is still beyond the time that they are suggesting they can get the, the, uh, the project done in. It just, it sort of shortens the indefiniteness um, of it. Uh, I'll, I'll go to Sean, Liz, I do see your hand, and uh, Sean, any response? I, it, I thought there was a 2024 deadline. Yes, yes. So typically these letters of concurrence have a three-year time frame. So they have already received one extension in, in 2018. So it's set to expire this year. Um, so that's why they're back before us now. Um, as far as I know, we can reduce that time frame. So, if council wishes, we can we can make it uh, twelve to eighteen months. Um, but that would be a, a decision of council for sure. But it, even if we were to, it, so is the idea of making it shorter in 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 hopes of just sort of them getting a giddy up on it? Because if if we shorten it, they can still come back and extend it. That is correct. Yes, if it is a, a twelve-month time frame, then they could be back in a year requesting an extension if it's not completed by then. Uh, uh, Deputy Mayor Liz, um, I suspect that the uh, the delays that we've experienced with their applications in the past have been associated with the award of Eorn's project. Uh, there was a long period of time within there were some pretty serious negotiations with the province and the feds 
about you know their their portion of the funding and approvals and, uh, and now that it, that Rogers is part of their the Eorn project there's definite timelines set for the completion of the work so I, I really don't believe that that there is cause for concern about it going on for too much longer okay so that's good uh, and um... And does that answer, do you think that provides the, the answers that were sought in our, in our public outreach? Councillor Dayud, is, is that what Sean has provided? Do you think that's satisfactory for, for that? Yeah, no, I, I do. And I, I appreciate Deputy Mayor's thoughts. Because, and, and even in their correspondence through Sean, it does seem like the, 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 the formalization of EORN is really given them that ability to, to motor through. So I'm, uh, I wouldn't necessarily stay steadfast to the idea of, of reducing the time. Um, uh, that's up to other members of council to say. I do think if we can get into the agreement, um, the, the promise of a shield, uh, should a light be affixed to the top, that that, that would be a definite. Um, but but indeed, Eorn is probably the the driving force, not our desire to shorten that um, that time frame in getting the project done. Well, and the other thing too, just I think it's just worth noting as we always try to take the opportunity when it, it presents itself that um, council does not have the authority to say yay or nay. Uh, our process is merely to uh, provide assurance that that a process has been followed. So I mean, even if even if any township said, no, we, the council doesn't want that tower in that location, the tower will probably happen in that location through the federal channels. And so um, it's just always worth reminding folks that, that may be concerned about these things is uh, the council isn't approving uh, tower sites. We are approving, um, you know, concurrence with, a, with a, an existing process. Uh, Liz, you were gonna add something? Um, I, I concur completely with with Jen's thought about needing the shield for uh, for better night skies, but it does uh, sort of strengthen the argument of of getting a uh, night sky policy in place. I think that you know that would strengthen this kind of request. Yeah, fair enough. Um, okay, so um, may I have a mover and a seconder uh, on this report? Uh, Deputy Mayor Danielson and uh, Councilor Dayu. Moved by Deputy Mayor Danielson, second by Councilor Dayu. Be it resolved that Council of Nolan received a request from Rogers Communications Inc. regarding a request for concurrence extension for the Rogers Communications proposed wireless telecom site known as C4384, County Road 8, part of Lots 21 and 22, Concession 11, Township of Sherburne. And that in accordance with their letter dated September 7th, 2021, Council approves the request for concurrence extension until November 18th, 2024, subject to the original commitments by Rogers Communications provided at the March 5th, 2015 Council meeting, and as contained in the March 5th, 2015 correspondence from Rogers Communications to the Township. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sean. Thank you. Uh, external boards, I'm just going to visually scan and anyone who's going to raise their hand if they've had a meeting or has anything to say. I don't think there's, I think everything's just sort of either not meeting or status quo. Okay, very good. Uh, correspondence, nothing was brought forward. So may I have a mover and a seconder to receive the correspondence listing? Uh, Councillor Dayu and Councillor Shortreed. Moved by Councillor Dayu, second by Councillor Shortreed. Be a resolved council receives the correspondence system for the period of October 14th to October 27th, 2021, for information. All in favor? Carried, thank you. Uh, and may I have a mover and a seconder to move into closed session? Uh, Councillor Shortreed and Deputy Mary Danielson. Moved by Councillor Shortreed, second by Deputy Mary Danielson. Be it resolved that Council hereby adjourns its open session at 1124 a.m. in order to proceed into closed session for the purpose of discussing the following. One, litigation or potential litigation and advice subject to solicitor client privilege in accordance with sections 239.2.8e and 239.2.f of the Municipal Act 2001 SO, zoning bylaw compliance matter, and two, litigation or potential litigation in accordance with sections 239.2.8 of the Municipal Act 2001 SO as amended, a zoning bylaw compliance matter. 
All in favor. Carried, thank you. Just take our usual time to move and uh, and for our staff to uh, move along. Excuse me. <laughs> so we just went live and I sneezed. I apologize. Um, may I have a mover and a seconder to resume the open uh, the open meeting? <laughs> Absolutely short read. And Deputy Mayor Danielson. By Councilor Short Reed, seconded by Deputy Mayor Danielson. Be it resolved, Council hereby adjourns closed session at 12:27 p.m. and open session resume. All in favor. That's scary. Thank you. Amanda Mover and seconder uh, for the bylaws. Councillor Shortreed, Councillor Dayu. By Councillor Shortreed, second by Councillor Dayu. Be it resolved the following bylaws be received and read a first time, consider read a second and third time, and finally pass with quote or seal of fixed. Bylaw 2021 128, being a bylaw to stop, close, and convey part of the original shore road allowance lying in front of Lot 21, concession 4, Geographic Township Stanhope, Beach Lake. Clark, bylaw 2021-129, being a bylaw to stop a close and bay part of the original short road allowance in front of lots 14 and 15, concession 7, geographic township of Stanwell, Falls Lake Smith, bylaw 2021-130, to authorize the mayor of clerk to execute a site plan control agreement between the corporation of the township of Long Island Highlands and Dimensions Health Made the Lake Inc., and bylaw 2021-131, to authorize the mayor of clerk to execute. Apologies. It's the MX four oh seven. My apologies, Council, for that. File one twenty one one thirty one to authorize Mayor and Clerk to execute an agreement with Sharpie Electronics for the supply of a photocopier. All in favor? It's carried, thank you. Uh, move on a second for the confirmatory bylaw. Councillor Dayu, Councillor Shortreed. Moved by Councillor Dayu, second by Councillor Shortreed. Be it resolved that bylaw 121-132 being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of council held during its November 18th, 2021 regular council meeting, be received and read a first time, consider read a second and third time, and finally pass with the corporate seal affixed. All in favor. It's carried, thank you. And finally, a mover to seconder for adjournment. Uh, Councillor Berry, Deputy Mayor Danielson. By Councillor Berry, second by Councillor. Deputy Mayor Jason, be it resolved that November 18th, 2021, regular council meeting is hereby adjourned at 12.30 p.m. All in favor. Gary, thank you, everyone. Thanks for a couple of uh, busy days, and 
We'll talk to you soon.